All right, well, let's, let's get going. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Dave. Uh, I am a fellow CMU alum uh, and uh, a serial entrepreneur. I've uh, started five different companies myself and worked with dozens and dozens of more. My, my current gig is uh, being the executive director of the Schwartz Center for Entrepreneurship. And this smiley dude here, Jim Schwartz, is a, a story on the wall back there, but the Schwartz Center is named after Jim. He's also a Pittsburgh native and a CMU alum. Uh, and uh, he gave us $30 million to, to create what is now the Schwartz Center, and it's been transformative. We've got this incredibly beautiful space here uh, that is the home for entrepreneurs on campus uh, and for the community to come. We held a, a, a speaker series for Black Tech Nation last night. I don't know if anybody here is in the room, but it was it was awesome. And uh, so we're uh, really, really excited about uh, the Swartz Center today and the Swartz Center of, of the future. If you don't know Jim Swartz, he's the founder of Axel, and that is one of the top VC firms. If you don't know that VC firm, you know the companies he invested in. They were the first institutional investor in Facebook, first institutional investor in Slack, and a hundred other companies that you've heard of. Uh, so Jim has been just an incredible supporter of, of the network here. And if you look at the different pillars, there's people that uh, have helped make this all happen. You know, it's always important to, to remember history. And we're going to try to remember a little bit of history today when we talk about the approach of entrepreneurship here, here at Carnegie Mellon. But we have a tradition uh, as we always start off by uh, allowing our entrepreneurs to connect. This is the Connects Workshop Series to connect with each other. And, and the way that we do that is we basically give an open mic to the, to the audience to stand up and talk about the startup that you're working on and the needs that you have. Or if you don't have a startup, but you're a talented person and you are interested in different areas to say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in these areas and I can help startups in that area. Or if there's an event that's coming up uh, that you want to uh, promote, that's something that you can do as well. Uh, I put this uh, picture up here. Uh, this is Austin Webb and Austin Lawrence. They started a company called Fifth Season and they met at a Connects workshop. And that led to what they called founder dating. They would get together for coffee chats for a while and realized that they had a lot in common. And um, so they built this large scale indoor vertical farm. Um, oops, took that picture out there. So, so what I would like to do right now is, is, is uh, sort of open it up to you all to talk about your startups and, 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 and you know, let everybody else know what you're working on and then ask for any ask that you have and needs for help that you have. Or if you don't have a startup, like I said, you you if you have a talent that you would like to make available to the community, or if you have an event, I know Connick has an event you might want to tell us about. Why don't you start off by telling us about your event? Hi, David. You know, let me tell you, Jay is one of the nice people you can know. I, I can tell you that. He has this small stage in American Chamber of Commerce, and we've been having it with uh, my own startup. Um, so we have a event coming up, it's called the Smoke Bucket Technology Summit. Where we're going to have virus engineering, biomedicine, and business of biotechnology. I was hoping they will be there and say, I hope you can convince them to be there. The 26th, so, right? It's on the 26th of October, and the kind of thing is science and tech. All of you are welcome down. There's a lot of interesting topics. And some of the leaders in the region are going to be there. And I'm hoping all of, all of you are going to be the leaders of the future. Thank you for coming. So, if you haven't gone to the Carnegie Science Center, it's worth it for just that. Now you're going to have a great event and a great networking opportunity with the biotech community. So if any of you are interested in biotech, you should put that on your calendar. Yeah. Anybody want? Oh, I'm going to pick on people. Nathan, stand up and talk briefly about your startup. That way we can get going. I know you didn't want to do that, but you got to got to see the. the yeah, so I, I'm uh, I'm Nate Addison, uh, working on a legal tech generally AI startup. Uh, I'm here with my co-founder Derek. Um, so we actually don't really have uh, needs right now, but we're hoping to have needs soon. So I'll definitely. What do you anticipate to be your needs? Probably engineers at some point. Oh, <laughs> really? Nobody needs that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, NLP engineers, uh, really, really uh, unique task, um, but not. Good. Thank you, Nate. Appreciate it. Avalon, you're always working on something cool. Um, right now, I'm in the coming up the ledgers class um, with Steve Paul. Yeah. Um, and I'm leading a group for a new social startup uh, selling social media. The idea is a friendship development app. It's really early stage, and I'm working with a group of other students. Um, so I'm going to be talking about that. That's pretty exciting. 
Avalon's amazing. She started coming to the Source Center before she ever started her freshman year here. I swear to God that she has a sleeping bag in the back back there that she sleeps here. So, uh, great. Ruben, you had your hand up. Yeah. So, um, I'm Ruben. I'm, I'm, I was an architect for nine years and I'm trying to start this new idea. I'm going to Project Olympus and I'm planning on going to Pat Soria. I'm looking for undergraduates that may want to help me. But basically, it's analyzing construction specifications and looking for embodied carbon saving. So, if you're interested in sustainability, we'd love to talk to you. Cool. Thank you, Ruben. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan. I'm a master's in innovation here at CLU, uh, second year. I'm working on a platform to make use AI to make the process of working research and user research easier. So, I'm looking for uh, people with the main expertise in. Uh, that area, um, technically in class, so I can go from the platform, but I'm looking for other people with LLM uh, expertise to help me build the platform to collaborate on that. So if anybody's interested, please feel free to reach out. Cool, Dan, thank you. We have an online. I, 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 I can't yet. Can you have yeah. them speak? Go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Jordan Tubb. I'm a first year software engineering student at CMU Silicon Valley. Um, I'm working on a gift uh, gift sharing application that aims to improve the the gift sharing experience. Uh, since I have a uh, engineering and business background, I'm looking for a creative person who's more, um, you know, into UI UX and you know branding and all that. Um, so if that's you, uh, feel free to reach out to me. My name is Jordan Tad. I met Jordan last week out at the CMU Silicon Valley campus. We just did a three city tour for our venture bridge uh, pre-seed investment fund. Uh, we took uh, uh, the, the 12 current cohort teams and then five alumni companies spoke here. Some of you were at that event right here. We did it in New York City and then we did it out in CMU Silicon Valley's campus. Uh, Jordan's a Boston University Terrier and he played basketball for them. So there's a fun fact. Anybody else wanna share? Yes, please. Um, so I can't exactly say that I'm a startup or anything like that. By the way, I'm a MOOC day site. Uh, I'm a first year grad student uh, at Heinz in the Information Systems Management Program. Um, so I don't really have a startup source, but I want to talk about how sports did help me. So um, I, I came to the uh, entrepreneurship boot camp uh, last month, mm -hmm. and uh, prior to that, I was actually you know, while I was while, after I got admission to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I was looking for roommates, uh, and I felt that there was a lot of issues in finding roommates that I had myself. Uh, so I actually just created a simple Google form and like plugged in a recommender system to that to help me find compatible roommates. Uh, and I, I got approximately like 500 responses from oh, people my. on the group, uh, and just made it publicly available for everyone. Uh, and I, Oh, in the you know, zooming in to the entrepreneurship bootcamp, I met Shreyas, who was who's actually a project, a project Columbus. Um, he has a startup there, yeah. he's working on something there. Uh, and he was actually building a generative AI solution for finding apartments in Pittsburgh, another issue that I encountered. Yeah. So well, it, well, we connected uh, and we're looking for a synergy between our ideas and trying to you know, build something. So. Sure. That was a, a helpful experience. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. So, so I think what you see from just the, the few people that shared is that, you know, there's a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration that goes on. We had people from different schools, from different campuses and uh, the Silicon, Silicon Valley campus. And if you read that sign, it's at the front door. It's kind of emblematic of our approach to entrepreneurship, which is the ideal startup team is hacker, hustler, designer, right? The hackers are the technical people that can actually build things. Uh, the hustlers can be technical people or business people or design people too that get out and talk to customers and talk to potential partners. And then the designers are the glue people that help to you know to get it all together because ultimately what you provide to your end users, your customers has to be simple and easy to use and design. That's what designers are about. And we'll talk a little bit about that in our, our approach today. So why don't we just get, get started? Um, so the, this uh, talk that I'm gonna give today actually bore out of a collaboration um, that Carnegie Mellon has with Innovation Works, which is the Pennsylvania-based seed capital firm. Uh, if you haven't heard of Innovation Works, you might have heard of their accelerators, Alpha Lab, Alpha Lab Gear, and Alpha Lab Health. Uh, uh, we work together to, to, to design an approach 
to how to get startups from zero to one. You hear that zero to one, zero being the idea stage, one being product market fit. And at that point you can scale your company. So we're going to talk about that zero to one, right? Most of you are coming in here today with an idea that you're working on. It's still early stage, or you might not yet have an idea, but we want to give you sort of a, the framework of how we approach it here at Carnegie Mellon. And then all of the programs that we have, all of the courses that we teach, which is where you would pick up the, the, the toolkits, the nuts and bolts, the best practices uh, uh, of that. So uh, today we're only going to hit agenda item number one and two. Um, I'm going to talk about the history of the Lean Startup and where it came from and why it's relevant and important to you. And then we're going to watch a video from a guy named Eric Reese, who wrote the book Lean Startup, definitely if you've not read that book. It should be on the top of your list of books to read. Uh, it gives a really good, sensible approach, and we marry up with uh, with the approach that that he has there. We also have a bunch of videos online that we've done with startup companies. They're basically video case studies, and uh, we can share those with you if you're interested in it, on how a company called Four Moms, which we'll, we'll approach today, uh, uh, approaches this as well. So, with that said. Uh, Let's get started. I always, uh, you know, the, the, when the lean startup concept hit about a decade ago and hit, hit the, the startup world hard, everybody said it was about web 2.0 kinds of software companies. And, and yes, um, you know, Eric Reese was in that world. I was in that world. And we successfully uh, applied these concepts. But you can successfully apply them to robotics companies. I'm a part of, I'm on the board of many robotics companies, Four Moms, Shift Robotics, who have the Moonwalker shoes that you've probably all seen. Uh, we're using these same concepts in those companies. It's just that the timelines are different. With software, we can narrow things down to one, two week, four week sprints that in the terms of, of Scrum. With hardware, it's more like quarterly, right, that you're doing kinds of things. So these concepts do matter. Uh, uh, and we've seen it with four moms. Uh, this is Henry Thorne, CMU alum, Rob Daly on the left there. Uh, they've created one of the most uh, interesting uh, baby products companies out there by applying low cost electronics and robotic concepts. Uh, their Mamaru seats have millions and millions in the market. Um, uh, Hannah uh, and Matt created a company called Soul Power in 2014. They won the Invention of the Year Award. Um, they applied these concepts. Uh, you know, they had a, 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 a sensor in the heel of your shoe through kinetic energy would turn it into uh, electric energy and it would charge your batteries, right? Uh, and this is Meredith Grelly. She's sitting right there in that room back there. She's uh, one of our professors now here at CMU. She applied some of these concepts to the product that everybody loves, whiskey. Right. And uh, so so we can talk and you'll get to hear from uh, Meredith about that. So um, what I like to do is start things. Oops, this is not animated. OK, that's all right. That's your it's probably PDF rather than a PowerPoint, right? Uh, OK, all right. Re regardless. So I want to do a uh, uh, started off with a riddle and the, the riddle. The answer is at the top already. Oh, it's been ruined. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the the joke here is there's an old fart, uh, Frank Demler. Have you guys met Frank Demler? If you haven't, you will. He teaches the funding early stage ventures at the graduate level. Old cars and uh, old glory. And the joke is, is that there's nothing new under the sun. And, and this concept of the lean startup is not something that was invented in the last decade. It's actually based on... Um, some very, very valuable principles, and we'll talk about why, what those principles are and where they come from. So uh, let's start with this concept. It's called Kaizen, right? Kaizen. Does anybody know what Kaizen is? Somebody, raise your hand. Tell me, what is Kaizen? Dude, rapid, continuous, incremental improvement. I gave you the cliff notes. No, Derek, go ahead. Finish what you were saying. Uh, Yes, there you go. Rapid, continuous, incremental improvement, right? I'm sorry, I'm having fun with you. Don't, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not picking on you, right? But does anybody know where this concept of Kaizen came from? Japan, okay, who else? Toyota, who else? Japan? Uh, since you're asking the question, I'm gonna guess a lot earlier than you would think. No. <laughs> but that's a good guess. I like that. He took a risk. 
I like that. Take risks. It doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong answers, right? We'll, we'll try to guide you on that path. But a lot of people think it came from Japan and it was Toyota and those, those are related, but that's not exactly where it came from, right? So what, what happened uh, was that uh, World War II happened, right? And it was a horrific, horrific war. And, you know, the U.S. at the end of the, end of the war game, you know, they were going in and firebombing Tokyo. And there was going to be a lot of loss of Japanese life and a lot of loss of American lives. If that would have continued, they made the fateful decision to drop two atomic bombs on to, to Japan. A uh, horrible, horrible thing. Uh, you know, I'm not here to be political about whether that was right or the wrong thing to do. But what it did create was a situation in Japan where industry, oh, look at those. Go ahead, turn them on and turn, run around. Yeah. yeah, this is Roshni. She is the, the president of the Undergraduate Entrepreneurship Club. And she is also a Shift Robotics ambassador. You're going to see these shoes all over campus now. And uh, there's actually going to be a special deal for you to ask your parents to buy these for you for the holiday gift, right? Look at her go. Go fast, go fast. I got the class on Friday. There you go. She, you can say to your mom and dad, hey, I'm going to get the class on time. I won't be late again. My grade point average is going to go up. Praise the Lord. Tell that. Thank you for doing that. Um, so so uh, we were left with a, a, a industrial complex in Japan that was totally devastated. It was just level. And so there was a white sheet of paper about how we could build it back. In, in the uh, uh, Europe, we call it the Marshall Plan. Uh, didn't have a special name like the Marshall Plan, but essentially it was the same sort of thing. How do we rebuild Japanese industry? And um, so what they did is they said, okay, we don't we don't have to take the concepts that were being used before. We can rethink this all. And it turns out um, that there was a, a, an agency of the United States government that worked with the Japanese government to come up with a plan that they call improvement in four steps, or Kaizen on the Odon Donke. So that's where the term Kaizen came from. And it turns out that the person that was responsible for coming up with this plan is Edwards Deming. And Edwards Deming's name is so synonymous with quality, right? So the ISO 9000 uh, concept and the, qual you know, the quality award every year, like the Nobel Prize or like a Grammy or an Oscar, is actually called the Deming Award. So, so that it came from uh, the U.S. collaborating with Japan to help rebuild their industry. And the most famous application of it, Tim, was the Toyota TPS, Toyota Production System. Toyota didn't come up with it. Toyota was actually a first mover with that capability that was out there. And so this became the rage in the 1950s, right? In the early 1960s, this concept of Kaizen, modular manufacturing and placement, right? Uh, it's a little bit away from the Henry Ford, you know, mass production line. Uh, and it became very, very successful that other people started to, to take the notice of it. And the software industry was one of the next industries to look at this and say, you know, oh my God, you know, we've been using this waterfall methodology, which has all problems. They modified that to stage gate. You might've heard of the stage gate process that's out there and said, you know, all of that is too far reaching, trying to create long-term plans that we just won't be able to follow. Why don't we bring it back to these Kaizen principles, rapid, continuous, incremental development? And so it manifested itself in 2001 in the Agile Manifesto, and that was authored um, by uh, Sutherland and Schwaber. Schwaber is known as the father of Scrum, if you've ever used that development process. And, and basically what they said... By the way, the actual document itself, don't ever read it. It's like chewing glass. Uh, if you want to go to sleep at night, maybe you put it in the bedside, read a page of it, you're out. But what's embedded in it is actually great, right? Principle number one, we're going to honor individuals and interactions over processes and tools, right? We're going to talk to the people that are going to be using the product. We're going to favor working software over comprehensive documentation, right? We're going to get things into people's hands quickly, prototypes, right? 
we're going to honor customer collaboration over contract negotiation. A contract doesn't matter if the shit doesn't work, right? So let's get it in their hands and get it to work, make it work the way they need it to work, make it work with their workflows and their processes. And then let's respond to change when it happens rather than saying, no, 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 the plan says X, Y, Z, we're going to do X, Y, Z. No, what we're going to do is we're going to be in the field. We're going to be working with our customers. And we're going to learn how they use it, right? And we're going to change based upon their needs. So those concepts are actually incredibly powerful. And throughout the uh, you know late 80s and 90s, it led up to the Agile Manifesto. It's been very, very successful. And then the startup world took notice of what happened in lean manufacturing, what's happened in the sort of large production scale software development in the world from larger companies, both the SAPs of the world that were providing software for other companies or large corporations that were writing their own internal applications. They used this Kaizen and Lean methodology very, very well. Agile development, all of them are sort of synonymous, right? So the startup world started to look at this. And again, my, uh, my animations are gone. So we're gonna have to work on that one, Allison. Uh, you know, why do st most startups fail? And the answer is at the bottom real quickly is they don't talk to customers early and often enough. So some of you are in the Kickstarter customer discovery program right now. That program is targeted at helping you getting out and talking with customers. I think we have a bit of a mismatch though with what's happening in that program. And the reality, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is just doing interviews is not enough. It enters a lot of bias. And we have a lot of techniques that we've developed here that will help you do much better customer discovery through using design thinking principles. Are you guys familiar with design thinking principles? Okay, good. It's at the heart of what we do. It's why a designer is part of the, you know, the, the ideal team for a startup, hacker, hustler, designers. And design thinking does a lot more things than just talk to people. It has different ways to interact with customers to get the true needs that they have, the true problems that they face. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so again, my, my animations aren't working here, but uh, we uh, uh, had this next evolution of what people call the MVP, uh, right? And the MVP is minimum viable product. We don't, that's not what MVP means. MVP means most valuable player. Right, so uh, we hate that word MVP. And uh, my colleague here at Carnegie Mellon, Sean Amorati, came up with the concept of minimum and awesome product. Right, the product actually has to be good, and it actually has to be fun to work with. Because of it's ugly and boring and stale and hard to use, people won't use it. Right, so we want to get away from that concept of minimal viable product and move to this concept of minimally awesome product. How can we get our customers excited about what our product is, right? Any, any uh, football fans out there? Which kind of football? American football or the real football? Oh, there we go. Okay. Who's the best player of all time? Oh, man. Ronaldo's turnover in his grave. It's, it's actually Mbappe. Sorry. No, no. Messi, Messi's awesome. I'm glad he came to help the U.S. soccer scene. So, okay, so we we want to use this concept of minimally awesome product as opposed to minimally viable product to keep our mindset on doing something that's valuable, valuable to our customers. So, um, this all came together, um, and the, the the sort of authors of it, Steve Blank, uh, Eric Ries, and Tom Eisenman out of Harvard, and and they're put forth this concept is that your customer development is just as important as your product development, right? And technical co-founders typically say, no, 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 no. I know what people want and I can make a cool product. And they build it and nobody comes. So the concept here is not that you shouldn't be building early and often, you should be, but you need to do it being informed with who your target customer segments are and making sure that what you're doing with them is solving their problems in meaningful ways that are compellingly better or compellingly cheaper than the way they do it now. And if you look at the concept of customer development, we all focus on the customer discovery because it's the first step, but we forget that it's also about customer validation and customer creation, and then the ability when you go from zero to one to build your company and scale your company, right? So 
when I say that we, you know, this customer discovery misnomer, the problem is, is that too many people focus just on the first step and not the whole spectrum. And all of these take Kaizen into account because they're all continuous, rapid, incremental improvements. Okay. And so why this is important for startups, and you'll see this in the Air Grease video that we're going to put together, is that um, startups start with an unknown problem. It's a hypothesis. We haven't validated that problem yet, but the whole customer development, customer discovery problem, step one is about validating that it's a real problem that somebody is willing to pay to solve, right? And then product development. So we don't know what the right product, even though we know what the problem is, we don't actually know what the right product is at the beginning. We have a hypothesis of what it is and we start to build against that hypothesis, right? But so when I think of customer discovery, I think of two very distinct stages. One is problem validation. And the second is solution validation, right? But even before those two, there's an important first step. Before you go talk to that end customer that you think you're going to talk to, you should talk to two types of people first. Thought leaders and industry experts. Why? Because they're the people that are looking five and 10 years out on the horizon to see what's new, what's coming. They don't have all the answers, but they've had the discussions about what the issues are, what the problems are, and what some potential solutions are. So before you go talk to your first customer segment, the, the person in the customer segment that you use, that you're using for your business model canvas, target, you should talk to those industry experts and thought leaders. Where do you find those people? They're the people that are quoted in articles. They're the people that talk on panels at conferences, like uh, Canox having a biotech conference. There's going to be some people on those panels that are experts that if you're doing a biotech company, you could go talk to them. They're looking out into the future. What's happening differently, right? What else? Where else can you find them? LinkedIn, your best friend. Who here doesn't use LinkedIn every day? Literally every day. Get the hell out. No, I'm kidding. You should. You should because... Everything about people that matter in the world, for the most part, is on LinkedIn. And you have two things in your favor today. One is you can type in the title or the company or the topic that you're interested in, and then two magical worlds, or it's Carnegie Mellon. And what will come up is a list of people that can help you either be as a thought leader, as an expert, or as potential customers, right? Right there. And there's this little button that says connect. When you hit the connect button, what's the next thing that you do? And if you're not doing this, you guys do it every time. Add a note. Add a note. And in that note, you say, here's why I'm connecting with you. I've identified you as an expert or a thought leader or as a potential customer. And I'm a fellow Carnegie Mellon alum, and I need your help. And guess what? It works 85% of the time. It doesn't work 100% of the time because our people are busy and some of them are arrogant. <laughs> but 85% of the time, it does work, right? So LinkedIn's got to be your best friend. Now, I have nearly 12,000 LinkedIn connections, and the majority of them are part of email. Who in this room is not connected to me on LinkedIn? Right now? By the end of this section, you should be connected to me on LinkedIn because it will help. Because every one of my first and second connections will show up in every search that you do. And I've been building this database over the last 10 years so that I can be helpful to you all when you go to do your customer discovery, your customer development, okay? So very, very important to understand the power of that tool. It will help you. And the, in, in this sort of agile product development that meets the customer development, you need people to talk to. And this network that we're building worldwide in Carnegie Mellon is the best network for you guys. So... Again, I, 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 my, my builds don't work. That's all right, Allison. I'm not mad. We just need to fix the problem. Uh, so the, the, the original uh, um, riddle was there's nothing new under the sun. This should not be foreign to you. You all learned this in middle school science. It's the scientific method. And we're applying it to business, right? We start off with a theory or a hypothesis. We design an experiment. That's our interactions with our customers through customer development and customer uh, discovery. We look at the results of that as our team, and we say, are we on the right track or are we not on the right track? 
if we're not on the right track, we pivot to, to a new thought, a new hypothesis. And we go through this multiple times as we're going from zero idea phase through problem validation, solution validation to one product market fit. Right. So this is the process that we're going to use over and over again. Guess what? It ain't easy. It doesn't take a week. It doesn't take a month. It could take years. So you've got to build this into your habit, right? Customer discovery, customer development is not a point in time and a finish. It is a forever process in your company, right? It's got to be built into the DNA of the way that you operate. In the early days, everybody on your team, literally everybody should be interacting with customers. As you get to one product market fit and you start to scale, that's not practical, but you have to keep your employees as you're scaling in touch with the voice of the customer. If you don't do that, that's inevitably where things go south, right? So customer discovery, customer development's got to be in your forever DNA. And that's, that's what we teach here at, at CMU. And this is not new because that old fart was my professor here 30 years ago, and he taught me a different version of this, right? Feasibility, verification, demonstration, commercialization. It's the same damn thing, just different vocabulary, right? It's the scientific method applied to business. That's why this works, right? It's not that some brilliant guy named Eric Ries came up with a new concept. He did not. He just found a way to communicate it better with the evolving tools, right? The tools we have today are better than the tools we had 10 years ago or better than the tools we had 20 years ago, right? So he was taking the new tools and applying this scientific method applied to business to startups. And so what I'm going to do now is uh, show you a seminal talk that uh, Eric did about 10, 12 years ago at a conference that uh, his words will be, he'll use a little bit different vocabulary than mine. And so as an entrepreneur, you have to be able to learn that vocabulary is fungible. Sometimes people say the same thing and they mean completely different things. Sometimes they're saying one thing and it sounds different and they're exactly the same thing. You as an entrepreneur have to navigate that semantics and then do a better job, okay? So that's uh, fire this. Eric Reese, by the way, I write the blog Startup Lessons Learned, which hopefully will show. On here. Uh, the, the hashtag is Lean Startup, if you would. Thank you. I would like to ask all of us a simple thing, which is to stop wasting people's time. And here's what I mean. We all know that startups fail. We're accustomed to that. Uh, I thought I'd brought up, bring a demonstration. This is Web 2.0, circa 2006, when our enthusiasm was at its peak. A graphic designer put together this patchwork quilt of logos. And then I also brought what I consider to be our midterm report card. It looks like this. This is Web 2.0 circa 2009. You can already see the blood red X's of all the companies that are no longer with us. And yet the designer also made an interesting choice to mark with green circles the supposed successes of Web 2.0. Those are the companies that have gone IPO or were acquired, which means they were acquired. No and which is another way of saying those are the companies where somebody made money. And I'm all for people making money. But my question for today is, how many of these supposed successes succeeded in living up to the raw talent, passion, time, and energy that the founders and employees poured into them? And I think by that higher standard of success, we're not doing very well as an industry. And in case you think I'm just picking on startups, the same statistics hold true in new product introductions in the enterprise, in the supermarket, uh, it's true of corporate IT projects, and I don't think it's because we're taking too much risk. On the contrary, I think we're taking not enough risk because we are building products that fundamentally nobody wants. And that is a preventable condition. Now, uh, that is what, when I say stop wasting people's time, that's what I mean. We are building faith-based initiatives, and that's not a good idea. We are taking untested, unvalidated assumptions, and we are pouring people's time and energy into them. Now, lest you think I'm being negative about entrepreneurship, you should know I think entrepreneurship is awesome, and that this thing we call software, internet, web 2.0, is changing the face of work in this world. 
Software is imagination made tangible, and because of that, it has nonlinear effects in every industry it infects. And that causes disruption, chaos, lowering of barriers, and stress for our friends who are in established businesses, but tremendous opportunity for entrepreneurs everywhere. And in the last year, as I have traveled the world talking about this thing called the Lean Startup, I have gotten to see that there are now more practicing entrepreneurs on this earth than ha have ever been in the history of the world. And those entrepreneurs are not necessarily going to make any money. Let's be honest. Entrepreneurship is not a good way to make money. I'm sorry if there's some of you for whom that's bad news. But entrepreneurship is a noble calling. It combines uniquely among careers three simultaneous things. The ability to change the world for the better, the ability to create lasting value, and also make customers' lives better, all at the same time. And yet, it is these very entrepreneurs who are wasting people's time building something that nobody wants. And I think in order to stop that from happening, we have to put the practice of entrepreneurship on a more rigorous footing. And the first step is to begin with a definition. So here's mine. A startup is a human institution designed to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. Notice I didn't say anything about what industry you're in, or what sector of the economy, or even the size of company you work at. In my travels, I have gotten to meet many very talented, involuntary entrepreneurs who tried to take a safe job at a safe company in a safe industry, but then discovered there's no such thing in this world. So anyone who's trying to create disruptive innovation under conditions of uncertainty is an entrepreneur. That's not a metaphor. And that's just a fancy way of saying a startup is an experiment. An experiment not just in can we build a product, but should we build it? And more importantly, can we build an organization, a sustainable organization, to support that series of products and services? And the funny thing about that definition is it means that entrepreneurship is management. Huh? Because when we think of management, we, most of us have a very 20th century view of what that looks like. We think of general management, as was practiced in the 20th century, the general management that powers the supply chains that, let's face it, keep us all alive. But I believe we need a new management science, entrepreneurial management, not better or worse than general management, but different, geared specifically to the principles of extreme uncertainty that is the soil in which all entrepreneurs live. And the first uh, of those management principles I want to talk about is this thing called the pivot. Um, the pivot is a word that's gone a little bit mainstream this year. It's entered the zeitgeist. I knew when I saw this in the New Yorker. I don't know if you can read this. It says, I'm not leaving you. I'm pivoting to a new man. <laughs> so sorry about that. But that cartoon actually has a certain wisdom to it. Because what entrepreneurs do when they have a vision and encounter difficulty is they don't just give up on the vision, but they don't just persevere the plane right into the ground either. They keep one foot firmly rooted in what they've learned so far, while systematically changing one other thing at a time. And that's why successful entrepreneurs do not have better ideas than unsuccessful entrepreneurs. They have superior process. And they have this kind of zigzaggy path from initial idea to eventual success which only in retrospect looks nice and linear, or unfortunately, when you read about it in the press. And the premise of the Lean Startup is actually very simple. If we can reduce the time between pivots, we can increase our odds of success before we run out of money. Because what matters in any entrepreneurial situation, from the garage to the enterprise, is not how much money do I have left, but how many pivots do I have left. So if we're going to stop wasting people's time, we have to learn to pivot faster. And yet, the fastest way to iterate is just to go around and around in a circle. That's not helpful either. We have to know, how do we know if we're making progress or just engaged in forward motion? And that is the enduring conundrum of entrepreneurship, knowing if I'm making progress. The Lean Startup takes its inspiration and its principles from lean manufacturing that confronted the same question. How do we tell the difference between value-creating activities and waste? As I mentioned at the top, many startups are actually building something that nobody wants. And if you're building something that nobody wants, what does it matter if you're on budget and on time or on schedule? Why are we using milestones and schedules to manage something which fundamentally is uncertain and has, in many cases, a fatal problem at the root? Instead, we need a new definition of progress, what I call validated learning. And I'll share with you how I came to that conclusion. This is how I was taught to do product development as a software engineer in Silicon Valley. It's called the waterfall methodology. Um, I'm sure many of you have uh, tried this. I was taught this as the, uh, as the manufacturing metaphor for software development. 
And you can imagine how pissed I was when I found out that they don't even use it for manufacturing anymore. So what's our excuse for doing it in software development? It's ridiculous. Uh, and the waterfall methodology is easy to pick on because we've had quite a lot of time to study it. But it's important to remember that the waterfall methodology does work when you're in a situation of the known problem, known solution. That is, when you're making something that is very similar to something you have made in the past, you can have this linear sense of progress through a pre-existing plan. That's why the unit of progress of waterfall is advancing to the next stage. As long as we're doing what we said we were going to do, we consider that success, even if what we said we were going to do was stupid. And that is what leads to this problem we call achieving failure. When you successfully execute the plan, but the plan takes you right off a cliff. Now, the last 10 years have been about this thing called agile product development. Uh, and I've shown here, this is extreme programming, which is my personal favorite of the agile methodologies. And Agile has the uh, important insight that if we change our unit of progress to a line of working code, we can stop achieving failure. And this point of view works when the problem is known, it's the solution that is unknown, which is often the case in corporate IT projects where Agile has had its biggest impact. So if we create specification documents that nobody reads, or documentation that goes stale, or create software with bugs that then have to be reworked, all that constitutes waste, and Agile uh, is a way of eliminating that waste. Unfortunately, startups don't live in this world either. They live in this world. The unknown problem and unknown solution. If we're going to sit a customer, an in-house customer, with the engineers, what if we don't know who the customer is yet? What if we don't know what problem we're trying to solve yet? Uh, there's a lot on this diagram I can't go into today. You can learn more on my blog. I just want to focus in on this idea of the unit of progress called validated learning. And I'll just tell you a story. Uh, I founded a company called IMVU, and the very first version of that product took us six months to build. And I was the CTO of the company. It was my job to be responsible for the technical architecture. And I don't want to mince words. The first version of this product sucked. Okay? It was every bit as likely to crash your computer as it was to give you your delightful consumer 3D avatar experience. And I was personally embarrassed to ship it. I was like, oh god, people are going to use it and think you know, we don't know what quality software is. I had this image of a journalist writing this article, you know, idiots launch software, don't know about quality. But turned out I needn't to have worried. Some of you already know the punchline because you've done this too, because of course nobody used the software. <laughs> we couldn't even get people to download it, so they couldn't even discover how buggy it was. And it was my co-founders who had to drag me kicking and screaming to the realization that we'd actually built the wrong product. We had once again built something that nobody wanted. And let's face it, I was depressed because I was the guy who had written, I don't know, 40,000 lines of code to build that initial prototype, almost all of which had to get thrown out. The good code and the bad code alike. Failure is a great equalizer of quality. And then I said, wait, are you telling me I would have contributed just as much value to this company if I had spent the last six months on a beach, on vacation? as I did killing myself to get this prototype out, I said, no, 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 that's not true. Because if we hadn't written all this code, we wouldn't have learned this important thing about customers. So then I felt better. And then I had this dark thought <laughs> that plagued me, which was, but if my goal of the last six months was to learn this important thing about customers, did I really need 40,000 lines of code to do it? Is there no way I could have had the same learning with 20,000 lines of code or 10,000? And then I was like, wait, what if I had just asked some customers if they would like to download this product? After all, 0% of them did. Would I have learned the same amount in one week as I did in six months? And that led me to this. This is the kind of the flux capacitor of the lean startup, if you will. This is the fundamental feedback loop that powers all startups, the build, measure, learn feedback loop. We take vision, we turn it into action. Through that action, we reveal the truth about our vision, and we iterate. And from this diagram, I can give you a heuristic for evaluating any process or managerial or architecture change in a startup situation, which is, does it minimize the total time through this feedback loop, or does it sub-optimize by helping us do only our narrow job function well? Most of the management practices that kill startups violate that simple rule. And with this diagram, I can now put the concept of the pivot on a more rigorous footing, because I can say a pivot is one full turn through this feedback loop. Now, there's a lot more to the Lean Startup. Uh, it looks like this. These are all the specific tactics and techniques that we teach. You can learn about this online if you're interested. What all of these techniques have in common is my belief that they operate at one specific stage of the feedback loop, but they have the effect of minimizing total time through the feedback loop. In other words, they help us stop wasting people's time. 
And before I close, I want to share one last thing. Um, this is actually a full circle moment for me. I first talked about the Lean Startup in public one year ago at the Web 2.0 Expo right here in San Francisco. And since that time, what began as a movement of high-tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley to increase our odds of success has really blossomed into something much bigger, a movement that I believe is dedicated to stop wasting people's time. Uh, you may be familiar with this. This is the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, the Lean Startup has reached almost the top of the peak of inflated expectations, and I am sad to say that I think we're coming on the trough of disillusionment pretty soon. Uh, so I apologize for the hype. That's not my goal. And because of the hype, there have been some misunderstandings about the Lean Startup that have become somewhat prevalent. I actually believe being misunderstood is a big step up from being ignored. So thank you. And I want to address those misunderstandings because each of them reveals a deeper truth about what we're trying to do with this movement. And so I thought I'd just talk about them briefly. The first is that lean means cheap. Uh, and people who feel this way really don't understand that lean has a specific word, a specific meaning in a business context. Lean is about speed, speed through that fundamental feedback loop, not bodies in motion, but validated learning about customers. Lean startups actually accelerate as they scale instead of grinding to that bureaucratic halt we're more familiar with. The second myth is that Lean Startup is just for Web 2.0 internet consumer software companies. That's my background, so that's an understandable uh, uh, understanding, but there are quite a few other theorists, uh, Steve Blank, Dave McClure, Sean Ellis, who come from different backgrounds who have been part of this movement. And I think we're starting to get the word out. As I said at the top, any business that faces uncertainty about what customers will want can benefit from these techniques. The third myth is that uh, lean startups are somehow small bootstrap startups. They, they either they lack ambition or they take pride in being cheap. But our goal, remember, is to create a human institution that can grow, that can change the world, that can have an impact. And in fact, as our friends in the venture community are starting to learn, when we actually understand what customers actually want instead of just what we hope or think they want, we actually have the ability to deploy large amounts of capital more effectively than in traditional models. And last, this is the most pernicious, that somehow by incorporating data or feedback into our entrepreneurial process, we seek to replace vision with data. And as I said right at the beginning, entrepreneurship fundamentally is about vision, about a vision of the world as it might be. And what I think is odd is that if we really believe those visions, if we really believe the world needs to change in an urgent way, then I don't understand how we can afford to be engaged in a faith-based initiative. I don't understand that. If we have assumptions that are essential to the success of that vision, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the world to test them against reality, to see what actually is possible, and, of course, to stop wasting people's time. So here's how to get in touch. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So I think that's a, a really, uh, you'll get a link into to that presentation from Eric. Uh, it's just a different set of vocabulary words talking about the same thing. So uh, on our website, we have um, the both the PowerPoints for all of these Connects workshops and the uh, uh, links to any videos like that. But we also have a YouTube channel uh, that you can go back and watch a lot of these Connects workshops as well. Um, so we talked about customer discovery and, and you know, uh, a lot of what we hear from from folks talking about customer discovery is go interview customers, talk to customers. And yes, that's important. Talking to customers is always a good thing, but it's not enough. Um, so we worked, uh, how many of you have met Adam Polisic? Okay, Adam is an entrepreneur in residence here. He uh, teaches over in the computer science AI department. Um, we came up with a, what's called a strategic design in a box. And, and these are a whole bunch of techniques for interacting with customers. That's more than just the interview. Um, there's the abstraction ladder, the affinity map, buying a feature, concept mapping, and, and I can go on and on. Uh, the, the, the link to this is also available on the Swartz website. Um, you got this working, your, 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 your mouse goes the opposite direction. So, but there's literally uh, many techniques for interacting with customers that are, we have video support, we have Miro support in there to help you figure out the best way to accomplish these things. So if you uh, uh, wanna learn how to do customer discovery on a more robust level, uh, we have those tools available for you. Um, to, to just finish up here with uh, the, the, the rest of the presentation, I, I wanna point out a few of, uh, you know, 
key pointers or barriers or things to think about as you're getting getting started in this process. So um, the first is that there are three failure modes that most startups find in zero to one. Uh, the first is the false positive and false positives can arise in many, many ways. But typically the, the, the most easy to describe false positive is you go out to a group of your friends and you're asking your friends about your product or service. That's called a convenient sample. It's convenient to get to those people. But guess what? Your friends don't tell you the truth. They're not being malicious. They're not trying to lie to you, but they're trying to say, what do you really want to hear? And I'm going to tell you what you really want to hear. And that can lead to false positives. The next is, I call it the signal to noise problem. You go out and you talk to lots of people and you're getting lots of different answers and you're not honing in on one signal that is telling you the truth of what's happening. And again, that's probably because you're introducing some biases to it. And I think just interviewing people uh, has all kinds of different biases that can come into it. So if you use that strategic design toolkit, these are things that you get you to interact with customers, you get to observe customers, but you're not leading them down a path with the questions or, or feedback that you're giving them directly. So the, dis, the, the design toolkit can really help you avoid the, the signal to noise problem. And then, you know, the problem three is like, don't stop building things people don't want, as Eric Reese says, right? Stop wasting people's time. You know, your product sucks, right? And so you, you got a problem validation and in your solution, you're just not solving the problem in a way that's meaningful to that customer. So that's a big failure mode, right? So really think long and hard about how you're going to continue to use Kaizen, continuous rapid incremental improvement in interacting with your customer to make sure you get that right product market fit and a product that's adding value. And so we talk about adding value with this concept of goodness factor. There's a poster over there with Don Jones. Uh, he endowed the Don Jones Center for Entrepreneurship in the business school uh, 30 years ago. He actually, I was a student here and I had the balls to ask him to start a company with me and we did and it was great. And one of the first lessons that he taught me uh, was the goodness factor. If you're entering a market, right, where, where uh, there's an existing solution, right, you have to be three times better than that solution to get anybody to switch. Or if you're entering the market with the same exact benefit, it can be three times cheaper, right? And you're not going to get anybody's attention unless you're compellingly better or compellingly cheaper because people are lazy, right? They form habits, lazy in a good way. We form habits. Just think if we had to think through every decision, not instead of just intuitively react four hours a day, right? So, so if we're going to be a startup that has impact, we have to have a goodness factor. Now, Don said it was three times better or three times cheaper. Fast forward into today's world, there's another book that you should read. It's called The, Lean, uh, the, the, the Hard Thing About Hard Things from Ben Horowitz, Andreessen Horowitz, and then Peter Thiel's Zero to One. Both of those books are great. They say with, with the proliferation of the cloud and other tools like artificial intelligence, right now the bar is higher. If you're going to get people to switch from what they're doing, you have to be 10 times better or 10 times cheaper. Those numbers, they, they don't really matter. They're just trying to deliver a message about being compellingly better or compellingly cheaper. So I see a lot of failure in that third failure mode, right? Is that you do understand the problem. People really have that problem, but your solution is not compellingly better or compellingly cheaper. So you really have to focus on that. And it has to be part of the DNA, part of the discussion that goes on from day one in your company. Um, and... We also have a problem communicating benefits, right? And so I think there are only three benefits in the world that matter, right? And everything else can be torn down and shown that these three benefits are, are, are a component of that. So the first one is saves time. That's something that's measurable. Time is the same to everybody. Saves or makes money. Units of money are the same to everybody, right? And I call this the Zuckerberg, um, you know, benefit. You know, why did he create Facebook? Because he couldn't get dates, right? So he wanted to get dates. He wanted to get connections. So he created Facebook, and it worked, right? And so it's not just dates, although you know, the, on the internet, Match.com, eHarmony, the Homebound. By the way, the League, which was started by a Carnegie Mellon uh, uh, alum, Amanda Bradford, just got bought by Match.com. So we have a histor history here at CMU. But getting customers are connections, getting investors are connections, getting employees are connections, 
getting a new supplier. Those are the kinds of connections. So if we can provide connections to people, that's that's a benefit, right? But if you think of, oh, you know, fame, happiness, happiness is different than everybody. Fame and recognition, well, I say people that uh, are want fame and recognition, you know, usually want money or they want to be get new connections, right? So that's that's what, you know, are components of that. Altruism, doing good. Most of the people that I know that are do-gooders, do again, they want connections. They want to be recognized as that do-gooder. So, so I'm not saying that there aren't more complex benefits out there, but you have to, when you're meeting somebody for the first time, they've never met you before, to get your point across about what the benefits are, it has to be saving time, saving or making money, or creating new connections that matter, okay? And I see a lot of failure amongst entrepreneurs because they're talking about the benefits in the way they think about it. And not everybody thinks the same way that they do. So if you do it in these three benefits, you're going to be uh, doing well. And we have tools. We have a, a whole uh, Connects workshop. This is taught in our Introduction to Entrepreneurship and our Lean Startup class is the Business Model Canvas. And the most important thing is everything starts with the customer. But we can't serve every customer that we're possibly going to serve, right? So we have to segment it down to a first customer. And we have to build our first MAP, minimally awesome product, for that first customer segment. We can move to other segments over time. There's another great book out there called Crossing the Chasm. Jeffrey Moore talks about the bowling pin strategy. The head pin is your beachhead market. That's where you're going to land. And ultimately, when you serve that first customer well, you can expand to the other bowling pins, right? But really, really important to take the, the business model canvas seriously. And the most important thing is to make sure you get that customer segmentation right. So those are just a few pointers that, that will help you get started on this journey. Uh, happy to open this up to any questions that you might have. How are we doing on time? Got about two minutes before we go. I'll stay longer if people want me. So when it comes to customer discovery, last time we talked about, you know, we have to figure out ways of not using our bias. Don't tell them about the idea first. When you're talking to, uh, you mentioned, we should also be talking about it to industry experts. Yeah. We should also avoid talking about the idea, or is that something that is still... It, I think it follows that same two-step process. First, talk about the problem. Yeah. We avoid getting them biased on what, what the possible solutions are and sort of get agreement on what the problem is, and then you can start to talk with them about solutions. So it's true when you're going out to the actual customer, it's also true when you're talking about the next one. It, it eliminates bias. Right. Okay. Um, yes. While doing that, don't you ever run into the risk of revealing the idea to the wrong people and if you don't have an IP on it, and assume, let's assume you're sitting on a gold mine. Yeah. So um, first of all, this is, this is a question that gets asked a lot about IP, right? No one gives a shit about your IP. They have their own IP that they're worried about. So the, the copycats don't happen until you're successful, right? When you're at the very, very beginning, people are, are unlikely. It's not, I can't say 100% for sure that no one's ever going to copy it. But when you're at that idea stage and you're just getting started, people are, don't reveal the method by which you create that great value with your IP. But what the value is, what your IP's value is, you should be talking to people about, right? And don't worry about that. It's very, very rare that someone's going to try to steal it. And if you have intellectual property and they do try to steal it, then you have a license to sue them, right? So that's what IP is about. So don't worry about being secretive. Get out and talk to people early on. Yeah, yeah uh, you mentioned starting with one customer segment. It might potentially be difficult to kind of go on from there. So I'm wondering how narrow can you be as far as there right now as the customer segment? Yeah. Because uh, if you get too narrow, I imagine you could lose opportunity to give it if you don't have the right idea at first. Yeah. But you also want to make sure you like have a vision. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, you have to be very narrow, right? And so when we talk about customer segments, we think about it in demographics, things we can observe and measure about them. So that's male or female, you know, it's, it's ethnicity, it's country of origin, all of those things are demographic. Then there's psychographics, what people's belief systems are, where they spend their time on the internet, right? That's part of the psychographic. And then the third piece of that customer segmentation is how they buy, right? Consumers buy differently than business to business products, right? 
because it's a business is inherently more complex. So we'll just go by example, right? So these are the Moonwalker shoes, and I can tell you literally 1,000 use cases for these shoes. But if we tried to meet all of those use cases with grade one, we would fail miserably. Right? I, I say that because I'm on board there. Right? So we, we narrowed it down to two starting segments. One are college students who have 30 minutes or more walk to get to campus. By using these shoes, they can get here in 10 minutes. We know that they can't buy them themselves because they're paying tuition, but their parents probably can buy them for them. So our segment is students coming up on the holidays or birthdays for their parents to buy that one thing. The other is the gadget guy, that 25 to 55 year old person. And it's a guy, not a girl, right? That's a segmentation decision that always has to have the iPhone 15 that comes out, right? Or the next new gadget, right? And so our you know, targeting them, we say, dude, you have a smartphone, you have a smartwatch, why not smart shoes? Those are two segments, and that's what we're focusing on. I can go to Tesla. We did this in our customer development and discovery, and find out that Tesla has a problem. So I was just out in Fremont, California last week at their plant, and when the car comes off the line, they have to put that car into inventory. And it will wear out. That warehouse is called a parking lot. And that parking lot's three miles away. They have to drive the car. So the guy driving the car, the girl driving the car, has to get out of that car and either walk back or wait for a bus. If they have the moonwalker shoes, they could get back three times faster and they could park three times as many bucks. That's productivity. Right? So we know that's a use case, but we're not focusing on that use case. That's one of the other bowling pins. The head pin for us is college students and gadget guys. Tesla is one of those other bold pins. And so once we prove that this product worked for our chosen segment, we can move to these other things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. What can you do that is not to answer the specific? It's typically part of that build, measure, learn cycle. So you you design the hypothesis, you run the experiment, and then you're looking at that data, the result of that experiment. That's when you make the decision. Yeah. Well, when when you question I had uh, during the presentation, so you uh, you talked about having. Customer feedbacks and input uh, repeatedly, right? Like mm -hmm. every yeah. every cycle, like you said. Yeah. Can you give us an idea about what the sequency should be? Because I'm afraid that if I keep them involved too much, it's almost like they're micromanaging my development process. So how do you know how much involvement you need? Uh, is it different for different types of product? It's different for different types of product, but but if you're selling a B2B software product, what's really, really important is a large company has established a set of processes and workflows, right? So whatever it is that you do, you can't change those processes and workflows. So you have to adapt your product to that processing and workflow. So every situation is going to be different, but the goal is, is that you in, 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 a, in a business to business buying situation, you have five different buyers that you have to, to satisfy, five different ones. Four of them can say no, only one can say yes. So you need a champion or a sponsor. That's, that's the person that's gonna help you understand who all the five buyers are. There's the economic buyer, that's the only person that can say yes. But you have the end user and you have the technical buyer. And those are the ones that you work on the workflow with in the process. And if they're happy, they'll be thumbs up and yes. The fifth type of buyer is the worst. They're called the financial buyer. <laughs> also known as supply chain or purchasing, right? And these people live in the basement of the building with no windows, and everybody comes and shits on them all day long. So when you walk in the door, guess what they're gonna do to you? <laughs> Shit all over you. So you gotta learn how to build those relationships, right? So, so that's a long answer to your question, but you have to really work with, in the business to business situation, the workflows. When you're choosing a customer segment for a consumer product, right? We really need to know not only the demographics, but the belief systems where people spend their time. Every consumer purchase is emotional. No matter what anybody says, it's emotional. And then we use logic to justify it later on. Okay? So you have to understand that for that customer segment, where they spend their time and attention and how they make buying decisions. And it's different for everybody. Okay. 
Yeah. 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 Uh, so, where do you suggest spending most of your time uh, interviews in that case? Um, so, so, you need the sponsor first because the sponsor is going to get you. So, even if you don't have the product or an idea or you just have an idea, you still need to find somebody that is forward thinking in that organization to help connect you with those folks. The people that are going to matter the most then are the technical buyers, the people who support the product, and the end users. So, it's making sure that you're providing value. Once you prove that you can provide that value, you and your sponsor can go talk to the economic buyer, say, here's the business case for buying this product. Okay. That, that champion, that sponsor is absolutely key. What do you mean by technical buyer? Technical buyer might be the IT group that has to support the product. Got it. Or it, it, it could be, um, in, in the case of that plug, they have a safety management group that has to make sure that everything goes on in that plant is safety. So they're sort of the technical buyer of a product like those new mock computers. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. yes. A question about recruiting. Uh, for example, those March, if none of the college students uh, buy those shoes, you don't pay for it, right? You go to some other customer. Set. Right. So, you can have multiple customer segments yes. to test out. But then, how do you decide that uh, after how many te tests, after how many tests, when do you? So, part of our customer discovery and then customer development process is to narrow it down to the two segments that we narrowed it down. We talked to a whole bunch of other segments along the process, but we knew that college students had the problem of commuting to class. Right, and it took a lot of time, and students were late for class, and that affected their performance. We did all of that in the early stages. We looked at other segments too, but we chose that as an acute problem. Right. Same with technical gadget guys. We had looked at other segments that were out there too, but those people are early adopters. They want to be first and buy, so we chose them because of their early adopter status as a psychographic uh, measurement of who they were. So, so you, that's why the business model canvas is so important, right? It's not just an exercise to lay down information that you know. You're actually making decisions with your business model canvas. And that it's called customer segment instead of just customer because we want you to narrow it down to just one or two customer segments to start with. And again, think about that bowling pin analogy. We start with that customer, but once we're successful there, we can move and serve other customers. If you're not successful there, we don't pivot, right? We try it. So you, what you do is just say, okay, we, we had that information. We chose the wrong beachhead segment. Let's move to another segment that we believe is our right segment. So that's that's a version of a pivot. Uh, that too is a pivot. Yeah, just to make sure that's Anyone's going to get in All right. Who? Sonia. Oh, where's, where's, oh she online? Yeah. Okay. Sonia, make your announcement. Thanks, Dave. Hi guys, um, my name is Sonia Ford. I'm a program manager at the SWORTS Center. Just wanted to remind you guys real quick about the Graduate SWORTS Entrepreneurial Fellows Program. The applications are due on Sunday, the 5th, August or October 15th by 11.59 p.m. We've already received over 130 applications, so please get those in as soon as possible. Dave and I are already reviewing applications that have been fully submitted. So make sure you get that done. And I just put a link in the chat for anybody who's still interested. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Yes, another mm -hmm. question. Is there ever an instance where the customers don't actually know what they want? A lot, yeah, yeah, a lot. And it, you know, so they, they, they have their own hypotheses of what they want, but then you know, the way to figure that out is where they actually give you money, right? So the ultimate sort of validation through any of these processes is people giving you money. Yeah, so right, yeah. And so with, with uh with the Moonwalker shoes, we did our Kickstarter and people gave us money for them. And then we had a pre-order section. In the pre-order, we didn't say just sign up to buy later. We had to put 50 or 100 dollars down. And that's that is the way we give the people Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, Right. Small question was uh, you talked about your product being fundamentally the product side, like a very different or the 10x, different 10x cheaper. Yeah. What if you're entering a segment which is very complex? Yeah, let's say, like, is it even wise to like enter, let's say, the automotive industry right now? Yeah, I, I mean, Elon Musk did with, with 
Tesla and then Rivian did and then Lucid did because yeah. they had a differentiated product that was electrical vehicle right. and they could prove to a certain segment, uh, typically the people that were climate conscious, that it had a lower carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. Right. So that segment bought for that reason. Uh, if you've never driven a Tesla or electric car, they are fast as you know what <laughs> out of yeah. the gate. So there's a segment that just wanted the shiny new auto, the gadget guy. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it's like a roller coaster. Like, mm -hmm. It is so cool to put the, the pedal to the metal in the, in the vehicle. So there are different segments that valued that. But I'm on the board of a $2 billion automotive dealership. And our board constantly reminds the company that you know, there's still 285 million internal combustion engine cars on the road and they ain't going away. <laughs> so the EV adoption is going to be retarded by that fact that there's such an installed base. But over time, that grows, right? So you can enter a commoditized space if you have a goodness factor. 10 times better, 10 times cheaper, you can compete. And one of your last lines you're talking about whether you're saving time, whether you're just you know, making it cheaper and whatnot. Would you uh, say that when it comes to environmental impact, would you ever add it to them? I think you can add that, but it's not a ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. That is for a certain segment of the world that cares about that. Mm -hmm. right? And so you could, in a sense, turn that into saving money, right? They, they believe that they're saving money in the long term because of a lower carbon footprint. Right there, but yeah, so there are all, always exceptions, but those three will never lose. Yeah, yeah, saving time, saving or making money, creating new connections. I like it. All right, thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great day.